So let's talk about five things you're required to do while serving the United States Army. What's up friends, I'm US Army veteran Christopher Chaos and in this video we're talking about five things that you're required to do in the United States Army which was inspired by the great response that you guys gave me with the five things that you're not allowed to do while in a US Army uniform. So related to that, I was gonna do five things that you must do while wearing the Army uniform and that was a little bit of a pain so this is just five things that if you're in the Army period, you have to do. And some of this stuff may transfer over to other branches. I'm not gonna go into other branches. This is army specific, so if it transfers to other branches, cool, but I'm talking about the army because I was in the army. So some things are obvious that you have to do if you're in your army. You have to shave. You have to keep a really close haircut if you're a male. You have to salute officers and all sorts of other things. But these are just five things that I handpicked because I figured maybe it'd be things that to someone who never served in the military at all would think were strange that you have to do. Now if you watch a lot of war movies, a lot of military movies, you pay attention on military stuff, then they may not be that strange to you, but for some people, it might be. So this is really in no particular order, but we're gonna start off with the first one. So on an army installation at 6.30 in the morning, they raise the flag, or they call it Reveille, and then at five o'clock p.m., they lower the flag, which is called Retreat. Now for soldiers, regardless if you're in uniform or not in uniform, and you are on post and you happen to be outside during one of these two events, then you are required to stand at attention and render salute to the flag. Now the way that works is there's speakers all over posts. There's these loudspeakers that are playing the song that plays in the morning at 6.30, as well as the retreat song that plays at five o'clock p.m. I'm not sure if those times vary to different posts. I'm pretty sure it's pretty much universal, 6.30 and five. But when this song is playing, then a soldier has to stop whatever they're doing, stand up, face the direction of where the flag would be or they believe the flag is. Most soldiers usually know where the flagpole is, the main post flagpole and that's the direction they usually face in, unless you're in formation. If you're in formation, you're just staying kind of where you're at. Because obviously at 6.30 in the morning, soldiers are doing PT, so sometimes we do this in the morning during PT. So they would face the direction of the flag, maybe the direction of the music and render salute. When the song is done playing, then they can drop their salute and continue on. There was even like a controversy a while back of this female soldier that was like recording herself hiding in her car during either Reveille or Retreat, I don't remember which one it was. And this led to this big controversy. That's not something you're supposed to do. You're supposed to get out of your car, salute the flag. Uh, you're not supposed to like run indoors to try to avoid it, even though a lot of people still do this sometimes. Well, not, I wouldn't say necessarily a lot of people, but there are people that do this. But the respectful thing is to just stand there and render salute. Now, additionally, I believe civilians are supposed to stand there and kind of put their hand over their heart during the time frame, but that's not really gonna be enforced, really, but a soldier is going to be enforced to salute the flag during the morning or the evening when they're raising or lowering the flag. Me being a veteran, I uh, don't really like put my hand over my heart, but I feel weird saluting, so a lot of times I just stand at attention and face the music if I happen to be outside during any of those times. Next up, we have the second thing that's kind of crazy that you have to do while serving in the military, and that is remove your headgear, at least while in uniform. For some people, this may be common courtesy. A lot of people just do this as civilians anyways, but some people may be surprised to know that, or maybe not surprised at all, I don't know. But if you are a soldier, if you are in the Army combat uniform or the Army service uniform, you have a headgear. And if you go indoors, you must remove that headgear. Now the PT uniform doesn't have a headgear. Sometimes we wear a beanie, but usually they're not very strict on making you remove your beanie if you come indoors, but some people still do it anyways. But you don't necessarily have to remove your headgear if you're in civilian clothes and you're just wearing a regular old hat then it's up to you if you want to take it off or not. Some people still do it because maybe they grew up that way and they always take their hat off when they go indoors. But like I said, in those two uniforms, the Army Combat Uniform and the Army Service Uniform, you must remove your headgear. There is some exceptions to that. For example, one exception would be an MP, a military police officer, uh, when they are on duty and they are armed with a loaded weapon, they leave their headgear on while going indoors. But if you don't fall into any of those exceptions, then when you go inside, you must remove your headgear. And then when you walk back outside, put your headgear back on. That kind of goes hand in hand in some ways in, in the way of going indoors, you have to remove your headgear and you can't be wearing headgear indoors unless you fall in those exceptions. And then when you're outdoors, you can't be walking around without your headgear. You have to have your headgear on. Now we move into the number three thing. Now if you see my video talking about how vacation works in the army, you may be familiar with this one as you must inform somebody if you are going to leave more than 250 mile radius of the base. 
So this means no spontaneous road trips, spontaneous vacations. You pretty much have to plan it out in the army. You have to give somebody notice that you're gonna be outside of a 250 mile radius from the post. Those come usually in two different forms, usually either a mileage pass or a leave form. So if you're going on some kind of official vacation, you're gonna be gone for a week, you know, two weeks, whatever the case might be, then you put in for leave. If you're just gonna be gone for the weekend to somewhere that is outside of that 250 mile radius, then you have to put in for a mileage pass. And that gives you authorization to be outside of that. There are times when soldiers say, ah, screw that, I'm just gonna go and, you know, press my luck, I guess. That's not recommended, that's not what you're supposed to do, that is against regulation, and you have to let somebody know by either putting in one of those two forms to tell them that you're going outside of the 250 mile radius of your duty station. So next up we have the number four thing, and it's gonna sound kind of funny, but um, there are times when you are required to have fun. Soldiers commonly refer to this as mandatory fun and there are things like maybe the unit has like a barbecue, a sports day, a sports week and the unit requires you to attend this. For example like on Fort Carson they have a week called Kit Carson week where they have a bunch of sporting events and they have units going up against other units and they're all battling for you know the best unit in softball, in flag football, in soccer, whatever the events are and you're usually required to participate in one of these sporting events. And then at the end of it, you have this big barbecue, this big kind of get together where they do the awards ceremony and you're required to attend that as well. So that's kind of required to have a little fun and like I said, soldiers will often call this mandatory fun. But the units do this to try to build morale between each other so that you have a little bit of cohesion within your unit, maybe you and your battle buddies, which I'll explain that here in a little bit as well. But that's really the intent of it, not just to be mean and force you to have fun and you're like, I don't wanna have fun. No, it's to try to build morale within the units, but yeah, it is essentially trying to force people to have fun. So now we'll lead into that fifth thing and that kind of goes back to what I was talking about with battle buddies and essentially that means that the army kind of requires you to have at least one friend. When you word it that way it sounds pretty weird but soldiers will often refer to this as their battle buddies. I believe there was actually at one point they wanted to change that terminology and change it to like warrior companion and I, I don't think that stuck though and I believe it's still called battle buddies. And battle buddies are set in place for a lot of reasons. You'll have them in basic training in AIT, even when you go to your permanent duty station. Now that doesn't mean that you always have to hang out with this battle buddy person and they have to be your best friend or anything, but you are gonna have to have somebody that is considered your battle buddy. So like in basic, you know, you're not allowed to go anywhere by yourself. You have to go in groups of two. So they're gonna partner you up or make you partner up with someone and have a battle buddy. So if you have to go somewhere, you have to take a battle buddy with you. Same in AIT, you know, if you're getting some special privileges, some authorization to go off post or maybe to do some stuff at the PX on post or whatever, they don't want you doing that stuff solo either. You have to go with a battle buddy. And then when you get to permanent duty station, they still usually want you to have some sort of battle buddy. This is usually maybe in the form of a little card that you have to keep in your wallet that has their phone number on it. And if you're off post and you get in trouble, you've been drinking and you can't drive, then you can call your battle buddy. Or even just other things that are going on on post because they want you to partner up with someone, have a battle buddy to accomplish things with. And even really on post, they don't really want you doing things solo. I mean, they're not gonna stop you anymore because now you're you know permanent party soldiers, you're active duty, regular soldiers, whatever. you know. So you can go to the PX by yourself, but a lot of times on missions or whatever, you'll have a battle buddy, you have uh, maybe someone else that's with you. It may or may not be your battle buddy, but overall in the end, somewhere along the lines throughout your army career, you're probably gonna have a battle buddy. Hell, even the first sergeant and commander have battle buddies. Usually it's each other though, but even usually they higher ranking people have at least one person that is considered their battle buddy. So if you're hoping to be some lone ranger in the army, probably not gonna happen. You are still gonna get stuck with a battle buddy. You might not like that person, but you're gonna have to do things with them. So at some point in time, you're gonna have to at least get along. Otherwise, you're gonna have a rough time. So there you go, five things that you're required to do while serving in the United States Army. Now, yeah, I could probably reword those and they could just be five more things that you're not allowed to do in the Army. Like if I was to word it that you're not allowed to wear headgear indoors, then sure, this could be a not allowed thing. But that wouldn't be any fun. So that was why I renamed it and it's five things that you must do while in the army. But my current army viewers and veterans, if you want, leave a comment down below. What's something that you think is kind of crazy the army requires you to do that would be strange to maybe a civilian outside of the military? And for my viewers who are not yet in the army, maybe just interested in the army, whatever the case might be, leave some comments down below of which ones you think are pretty crazy and why. 
So you can find some more cool stuff in the description down below. I've got a PO box. I've got a link to a lot of the camera and equipment that I use and things that I recommend. You also find the link to pick up one of these awesome chaos t-shirts. And then of course, if you like the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. And then right over here, we got some recommended videos that YouTube says that you should watch from yours truly. And if you're not subscribed to me, then you should hit that subscribe button right now. Right now. Thanks for watching. I'm Christopher Chaos. I will see you next time. See ya.